Okay, let's get started with the webinar today. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, thank you so much for joining us today on this webinar where the IA will be presenting the key findings from our new report, Integrating Wind and Solar, Global Experience and Emerging Challenges. This report shifts our focus from merely expanding renewable capacity to capturing its full benefits, a crucial perspective for a clean energy future. My name is Pablo Koch, and I'm the head of renewables integration and secure electricity. And I'm gonna be sharing a bit of the background and thoughts on this analysis before other colleagues from the IEA will be presenting the analysis itself. What we're seeing is that solar PV and wind are the workhorses of the energy transition and they play a dual role in our path forward. First, they're essential to implementing the COP28 goals, goals that serve as a beacon of hope for achieving net zero emissions by 2050. The ambitious targets of tripling renewable energy capacity and doubling energy efficiency could propel us two thirds of the way towards a Paris aligned energy system by 2030, just by themselves. But second, the existing policy support and continuing cost reductions are making these technologies increasingly competitive. And that means that the growth of variable renewable energy capacity this decade is not just a possibility, but a reality that power systems worldwide will experience. However, our objective must extend beyond merely increasing capacity. We need to ensure that this capacity translates into actual power generation, into energy. And this is where the concept of integration becomes paramount, because realizing the full potential of solar PV and wind expansion will require proactive and thoughtful integration strategies. Now, the consequences of inaction or of delayed implementation are severe. Investments may slow and valuable energy will be wasted. As our colleagues later will show, our analysis presents that we risk geoparadizing up to 15% of solar PV and wind power generation by 2030. And this would potentially result in a 20% smaller reduction in power sector CO2 emissions. Now, a question you may ask is, can we really integrate high shares of VRE into power systems? And the answer is a resounding yes. Front runner systems worldwide have already today demonstrated that effective integration of high VRE shares is not only possible, but necessary and effective. While challenges remain, the evidence does give us cause for optimism. But let's not forget that most of the growth in solar and wind generation will occur in systems currently with limited VRE penetration. And this presents an opportunity to not merely follow the path of systems that have experienced this transition already, but to improve upon it. The critical question that we face is not just about identifying which technologies and processes exist for integrating renewable energy, because there are many. Instead, we must focus on choosing the right set of tools from this broad menu to ensure cost-efficient integration of VRE into diverse energy systems. Without considering affordability and security, the transition will not be successful. As my colleagues share the analysis today, I hope it will provide a comprehensive understanding of why integration is essential, what measures are available, and how stakeholders can collaborate to prioritize and implement these measures effectively, particularly policymakers. Please, during the course of the presentation and towards the end as well, feel free to use the questions and answers function in Zoom to provide questions that then the analysts will be addressing at the end of the presentation. I will now pass the floor to my three colleagues, Rena Kuahata, Javier Jorquera, and Jacques Warichet from the Renewables Integration and Security Electricity Unity Unit to begin the presentation. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that this webinar provides some interesting discussion and material for you. Thank you very much. Rena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pablo. Now I'm going to share some key insights from our new report, Integrating Solar and Wind, global experience and emerging challenges. Solar PV and wind have grown quickly in the past years and will continue expanding. Close to eight terawatt of solar PV and wind will be installed by 2030 in a scenario where countries meet their climate related commitments that they have announced. There are a couple of reasons for this. First, governments are positioning these sources as key pillars for decarbonizing the energy sector, and they are putting in place supportive policies. The second is that recent cost reductions in solar PV and wind are driving 
this growth. Putting this in context of the pledge to triple renewable capacity by 2030, current policies and technology trends put us on track to achieve more than three quarters of the growth needed. Fully reaching the triple, tripling target, it's possible, but it requires an even faster expansion of capacity than what we see here. To reap the economic and emissions benefits of the tripling of capacity or of any renewable capacity for that matter, countries need to focus on a range of measures that ensures that the renewables coming online is securely integrated and it displaces fossil fuel generation. As we deploy new solar and wind generation capacity, integrating it securely into our power systems is of paramount importance. Integration involves managing increased variability in the power systems from variable energy uh, resources like solar and wind, and system flexibility is needed to adapt to this vari variability in time and in space. Flexibility in time and space this sounds challenging, but global experience has shown that many countries are already doing a pretty good job. For example, Denmark, Ireland, Great Britain, and Morocco have increased their share of renewables, predominantly relying on wind power, while Chile, California, Vietnam, and to a less, and to a less extent, Australia, have adopted solar as their predominant source. This shows that systems have managed to integrate higher shares of variable renewables with different mixes of solar and wind, depending on which resource is more competitive in their area. Also, it's worth noting that some systems have greater flexibility and readiness to handle variability than others. For example, a well-interconnected system like Denmark is better equipped than an island system like Hawaii. But in the end, no matter what type of system, what's important is timely integration as the variable renewable capacity is deployed, because this allows us to harness the intended benefits effectively. Without timely integration, symptoms of tardy implementation starts to show. We are facing issues today like grid congestion and negative electricity prices. These problems affect businesses, and become a concern for investors considering new generation capacity. For example, cost for marginal grid congestion, sorry, cost for managing grid congestion, which includes curtailment, these are incre increasing yearly in the United States, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Negative prices, which in theory indicate oversupply, are becoming more frequent in Australia, United States, and Germany. These symptoms signal red flags to investors and that may reduce their willingness to build new solar and wind capacity. This is why timely integration is so important. It needs to happen in sync with the deployment of generation capacity. Successfully integrating solar and wind allows us to fully harness their benefits, like contributing to decarbonization, delivering affordable energy to consumers, and reducing dependency on fossil fuels. But it's difficult to know what integration measures should be implemented first and what works best at each stage of bringing renewables online. How can we ensure time integration so that we don't lose out on reaping the benefits of solar and wind as the investments intended to bring? To address this global challenge, the International Energy Agency has developed the phases of variable renewables integration framework. The framework classifies power systems into six phases of VRE, the Variable Renewables Integration, describing typical challenges at system level resulting from the impact of solar PV and wind, along with typical solutions to address these challenges. The characteristics of each phase are described here. So at phase one, VRE has no significant impact at system level, while at phase two, it starts to have minor to moderate impact. At phase three, the impact becomes quite significant as VRE determines the operation pattern of the power system. At phase four, VRE meets almost all demanded times and system stability starts to become a concern. 
At phase five, there's significant volumes of surplus VRE across the year. And at phase six, which no system has reached, the system has secure electricity supply almost exclusively from VRE. Phases one to three are considered low phases and phases four to six are high phases. Categorizing system challenges using this framework, it's helpful for policymakers to identify priority measures at each phase to ensure its timely implementation. When we look at power systems today, we see that most of them are currently in low phases. Several countries with different geographies and levels of economic development reached phase three by 2023, indicating that there's a wealth of global experience to manage the challenges in low phases. Only some countries are at high phases, mostly with high penetrations of wind. By 2030, a broad range of countries will be at high phases, many with high penetration of solar PV, like Chile, Japan, and Italy. It's worth noting also that some subsystems are at higher phases than their countrywide assessments. For instance, South Australia is in phase five, Kyushu in Japan is in phase four, and California in the United States is in phase three. Generally though, by 2030, more systems will be at higher phases than they are today. And now I will hand over to Javier to explain what this means from a global perspective. Many thanks, Rena. For this report, building on the phases of VRE integration framework that my colleague Renan just presented, we wanted to give a clear reference to power sector stakeholders of two issues. First, what kind of integration efforts will need to be done in the coming years, knowing that they differ depending on the current penetration of VRE in the system? And second, what are the risks of failing to implement sufficient integration measures on time? In this report, we not only explain these needed efforts and risks, but actually present a first ever quantification of them at the global level to have the best understanding possible of the magnitude and characteristics of the integration challenges that lay ahead. We highlight two main findings from this analytical exercise, which I will explain in more detail in the following slides. First, that most of the new VRE generation out of 2030 is said to be integrated in low phase systems where VRE penetration is currently still limited. Second, that failing to implement sufficient solar PV and wind integration measures on time can jeopardize a significant amount of VRE generation by 2030, which can risk making the emissions reductions of the power sector significantly smaller. Here, we try to be very clear. Later could be too late if integration measures are not deployed on time. Now, in the next slide, let's first have a look at the global growth in solar PV and wind generation out of 2030 in a scenario where countries meet their climate and energy goals. In this scenario, VRE regeneration grows by about 9,000 terawatt hours from 2022 to 2030, roughly equivalent to the electricity demand of China in 2023. Our analysis, based on a regional breakdown of current and expected future conditions for phases of VRE integration, solar and wind generation and capacity growth, found that of the VRE generation increase from 2022 to 2030, almost two thirds needs to be integrated in low phase conditions. This new VRE generation coming online in low phase conditions is equivalent to almost 6,000 terawatt hours, which is nearly two times the global VRE generation in 2022. The large majority of this growth happens in emerging markets and developing economies, such as, for example, Brazil, India, and countries in Southeast Asia. Many of these countries show remarkable solar and wind potential that can still be unlocked further. We believe this is good news as it's, it's much easier to integrate more VRE when the penetration of this is low or limited, as we will explain in more detail throughout this presentation. Now let's have a look at the next slide uh, at, at the impacts of not doing enough for integrating solar PV and wind on time. Our analysis shows is that failing to implement sufficient integration measures for solar PV and wind could have substantial consequences potentially jeopardizing up to 15% of VRE generation in 2030. In consequence, the VRE share of global electricity generation would reach only 30% by 2030, instead of the 35% that could be achieved if integration measures are implemented in full and on time. This analysis comes from our new integration delay case, a variation of the IA's announced purchase scenario, which explores a situation where sufficient integration measures are not deployed on time. 
This is essentially a case where implemented integration measures by 2030 do not differ substantially from those already introduced or being implemented uh, today. This case was created based on, on our detailed global stock take of phases of VRE integration and integration measures, which will be explained in more detail in the following slides by Rena, but also on the IA's projections for VRE deployment and also previous IA modeling for VRE integration in various regions around the world. In this case, we see that around 1,000 terawatt hours of VRE uh, in low phase conditions and another 1,000 terawatt hours in high phase conditions could be missed by 2030 if integration measures are not deployed on time. This means that there is a higher proportion of energy at risk in high phase conditions if integration measures are delayed, as the risk reflects the readiness of systems to deal with integration challenges. High phase systems tend to require more complex measures, which, if not well implemented, create a significant risk for new very energy in these high phase conditions. The good news, however, is that Although there are still emerging challenges at higher phases, several countries are already managing them effectively. Finally, let's take a look at the consequences of not doing enough to integrate new solar PV and wind. In our integration delay case, solar PV and wind generation at risk totals 2,000 terawatt hours by 2030, which is equivalent to the combined energy generation of China and the United States together in 2023. If this shortfall is compensated by an increased reliance on fossil fuels, it could lead to a 20% smaller reduction of carbon dioxide emissions in the power sector, putting the global electricity sector at risk of not meeting national climate and energy pledges and also could endanger the affordability of electricity supply. Now I'll hand it over back to Rena for her to explain our stock take of VRE integration measures worldwide. Thank you. So to understand which measures governments should prioritize, we conducted, we conducted a first of its kind stock take of integration measures in 50 systems worldwide, covering various geographies and totaling around 90% of global generation from solar and wind. This exercise categorized integration measures by phase and by system archetype to find common traits, like what are the widely adopted measures? What are priority integration measures at low phases? And how are systems handling emerging challenges? This structured approach allowed us to break down and draw insights from the strategies used globally to integrate variable renewables. Our assessment identified several key findings about VRE integration measures. First, that common practices exist across systems. These involve straightforward modifications to existing assets or operational arrangements that increase flexibility. These are measures shown in here in different categories and include enhancing power plant capabilities, which can be conventional power plants or solar and wind, incorporating forecasting in system operation, using demand side measures, enhancing grid capacity and its use, making system balancing more efficient and developing storage mediums. So the commonly applied practices involve a range of options that depend on the existing assets and processes. They are modifications to familiar tools. It might be just that it requires a bit of sharpening, tweaking or updating our expectations about how it ought to perform. And of course, countries apply these measures differently across phases, depending on what resource and levers they have available to them. Next, here is a mapping of the integration measures adopted by systems at different phases. And from this, what we found next was quite remarkable because it applies to systems in low phases of VRE integration, which if you remember from uh, Javier's uh, explanation, it consists of two thirds of the expected growth, uh, VRE growth in, in 2030. So here, the key insight is that VRE integration measures don't need to be implemented all at once or at its highest level of sophistication to be effective. Instead, implementation can be targeted and gradual, 
so that measures address specific challenges as they arise. For example, let's take demand response. Starting with industrial demand response makes sense because it allows you to mobilize large volumes of flexibility just by interacting with few consumers. Implementing time of use tariffs also is quite straightforward, like setting a lower rate during the day when there's high solar PV generation and a high rate at night when there's no sun. When more flexibility is required as you transgress to higher phases, the demand response program can be expanded to include commercial and eventually residential consumers as well. The way the tariffs are set can become more dynamic to reflect actual generation patterns in real time rather than based on fixed periods. And as seen here, gradually more and more systems adopt industrial and commercial demand response as the phases get higher. More than 80% of systems in phases four and five implement industrial uh, and commercial demand response, and a large share of them implement also residential demand response. Ultimately, for systems in phases four and five, it may also become necessary to steer the location of new consumers away from congested parts of the grid. What our analysis shows is that complete overhauls are not necessary for systems in phases one to three, while those in phases four and five implement almost all measures, indicating a full system transformation. For systems in low phases up to phase three, Implementing them as they become necessary and expanding them gradually is sufficient. But for systems in phases four and higher, they need to become foundations. They need to become the foundation to integrate further higher penetrations of VRE. The key conclusion for the low phase system is that the focus should be on deploying VRE capacity and implementing the measures gradually as the need arises. This should be sufficient to reap the benefits of VRA capacity expansion in low phase. Now I'll hand over to Jacques to give you insights on how to handle emerging challenges. Indeed, some front runner power systems today are effectively managing high levels of variable renewable generation. Systems such as Denmark, Ireland, Spain, and the United Kingdom are integrating from 35 up to 75% of wind and solar in their annual generation. In our framework, these systems are classified in phase four or higher, characterized by periods of low conventional power and surplus supply during low demand periods. At this penetration level, some challenges become more acute, in particular related to stability and flexibility. Stability is traditionally ensured by conventional generators, providing inertia and supporting the system voltage during disturbances. The guarantee that they continue to deliver these essential services to the system decreases as they are replaced by more distributed resources connected through converters. In addition, the more pronounced daily and seasonal variability also creates a need for more flexibility across all timescales. But the experience of these countries provides valuable insights for other systems around the world aiming to accelerate wind and solar integration including those in Japan, Italy, and Brazil that are expected to reach phase four or higher by 2030. To address these challenges, new frameworks are needed to extract further flexibility and system services from a wider range of sources and support the deployment of assets to ensure stability and manage surplus energy. There are well-known solutions such as prompt hydro storage and hydro, uh, interconnections but also other assets dedicated to solving integration challenges. Synchronous condensers have been deployed in Denmark since 2013 to ensure voltage control, both slow and fast, at high penetration of wind power. Battery storage is becoming widespread thanks to the decreasing cost of uh, batteries. And lately, some battery systems are deployed with grid forming capability to support stability. It is the case of Great Britain, where five projects have been recently procured under the Stability Pathfinder program. We can also mention bidirectional EV charging, which is tested in many cities around the world and offers great perspectives to increase flexibility and address daily peaks. Fortunately, most of the technological solutions to address emerging challenges are either mature or, need, uh, or nearing maturity. For many systems reaching phases four or even five, it depends mainly on effective deployment of the existing technologies rather than de developing new ones. 
while for phase six, viable technologies exist, but their implementation at a large scale depend, remains limited today and requires additional testing. The key to the actual successful implementation often lies in appropriate uh, policy and regulatory actions. This is why uh, I can observe that uh, to successfully integrate uh, VRE and address the challenges at phases four and higher, we need a transformation, a shift in our approach. In fact, we need to rethink the traditional method of planning, financing, and operating of grids. Essential elements include the modernization of system operating practices, the improved strategic planning, and uh, an overhaul of the regulatory framework. For example, to accommodate a lower inertia, Ireland has adjusted grid codes and operating practices to allow a higher rate of change of frequency, requiring grid users to stay connected all the way to one hertz per second up from the previous threshold, which was at 0 0.5 hertz per second. New methods for procuring and rewarding necessary systems are also needed, ensuring that they are maintained. In particular, we observe that, observe that fast frequency response is now procured in at least nine markets, including Great Britain and the Nordics. Market design must also evolve as well to accommodate the unique characteristics of solar and wind dominated grids, new technologies, and the new role of conventional generation as a provider of essential system services rather than only energy. Our report concludes with six key recommendations to policymakers. The first is assess your system's preparedness for VRE integration by improving your understanding of the resources available to you, identifying infrastructure needs and gaps in funding, data, and skills. The second is to ensure secure grid operation with clear requirements from a, a viable renewable generation, like forecasting, visibility, and controllability, and how it reacts to disturbances. Three, unlock flexibility from the existing power system to manage increased viability. Here, there are levels like optimizing dispatch, activating demand response, and making existing generation more flexible. Four, design incentives to garner flexibility and system services from a wide range of resources. This requires defining and quantifying the needs for these services and creating ways to procure them. Five, accelerate technology integration and innovation. Regulatory, market, and strategic support is needed to rapidly scale up existing ones and to develop technologies that are key for long-term decarbonization. Finally, six, adopt a holistic approach. Cross-sectoral dynamics needs to be integrated into power system planning and resilience needs to be considered in addition to security and efficiency. Global expertise should be shared, not just technically, but also at the policy, regulatory, and markets level as well. I conclude by saying that integrating solar and wind energy presents both challenges and opportunities. By understanding the phases of VRE reintegration and implementing targeted measures, we can maximize the benefits of solar and wind while ensuring the stability and security of our power systems. Thank you for your attention, and I hand over back to Pablo.